Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this lunchtime webinar. Uh, I hope you can all hear me loud and clear. Uh, I have to confess, I, I had a few little technical issues before we started, so if my fellow speakers uh, want to wave at me if anything is wrong, then please do so. I hope our organizers in the background uh, are going to share our uh, presentation. We do need to have a presentation on screen, please, background organizers. I'll just hold for a moment or two while we wait for our presentation to be shared on the screen. Looks like our presentation organizer is uh, is just trying to just bear with us while we while we uh, gather some of the. It's amazing how many times you practice a webinar and get everything organized, and uh, you get to the get to the wire, and just occasionally things don't quite work as they as they should do. Um, here we go. Looks like we are nearly there. So here we are with our, our, our banner screen. So welcome folks to today. And we've, we've got probably about 100 of you are out here in the background um, in uh, listening into our webinar today. So um, uh, I, I will just say one or two points of introduction, the points of, of, of housekeeping if we can move to the next slide. Um, the first thing is to say that we are recording today's webinar. Uh, so if you don't catch every single point of detail, then um, uh, there will be a recording available to, to you to listen to uh, afterwards. Uh, and we are produce, producing or have produced um, uh, an electronic book uh, covering the 15 step guide that we're, we're talking about uh, today. And my colleagues will be emailing every one of you uh, a copy of this guide uh, later on this afternoon, uh, together with a link to to this this ebook. So if you don't capture everything uh, in this lunchtime hour, then you will be able to capture it uh, later on uh, at your leisure uh, this evening. Uh, now, if we just move on to the next slide for a moment, please. Um, most of you will, I'm sure, by now over the last 12 months, uh, be used to the format of of webinars and and how they work. Uh, at the point of registration, you did have a chance to give us a few questions, uh, and a number of you have done. and And my colleagues have uh, uh, have been given those questions, and so we'll be um, uh, trying to cover those questions during the uh, webinar. Um, however, if you do have more questions, then there is a side panel on the right hand side where you can. Excuse me, pop in the, the question you have. We'll try and cover those between now and the end of the webinar. Failing that, we'll get back to you um, afterwards afterwards with, with them. So, okay, let's move on and, and start to boot to, to um, uh, think about uh, starting up a new business. Now, I was very um, well lucky and frightened and everything that probably some of you are experiencing uh, some 20 years ago when, when I was faced with the uh, challenge of of setting up my own my own business. My circumstances were such that that I was almost forced into uh, uh, having to do something different uh, and did that. So I guess a lot of you are at that uh, cusp of uh, uh, excitement and nerves uh, all in all in one go. And if we just move to the next slide. Um, one thing I'll say is, you know, over Christmas, over New Year, is a time when a lot of us will stop and reflect and think about um, the year ahead and our, and our careers. Um, and I guess it's a time to, to share a lot of that thinking with, with, with family and friends. Although, of course, this year would have been a much smaller bubble uh, of, of family and friends to, to share those ideas with. But it is a time, um, you know, 14 days into the, to the new year, uh, when you're still probably thinking about those those plans and ambitions, and do I want to do I want to start a, a new business or change a direction in in my career? So, what we've done here at Quill is to pull together a, a panel of experts, um, and I'd like to uh, introduce to you um, uh, three people who really do have uh, have expertise uh, in their particular field. Uh, there's Jay Birani from Birani HR and Employment Law, uh, David Gilmore from uh, DG Legal, and Joel Topham from Sagar's Accountants. So maybe each one of you would like to just give you a few a few words um, uh, about yourselves before we before we get into the into the detail. Jay, over to you for a second or two, please. Uh, yeah, thanks, Julian. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Jay Bayani. Um, I run a niche employment law practice um, called Bayani Law. We are uh, based in Sheffield, 
Um, we deal with straight employment law as well as outsourced HR services. Um, and since I set up, we've now opened offices in a few other locations, so Leeds, London, and we've just got a brand new one in Leicester. Wow. David, over to you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I started DG Legal back in 2000, and we're a management consultancy firm that provides advice and assistance to lawyers and law firms. And what we do is a mixture of compliance, starting up new law firms, training, and we provide uh, compliance software to help the coal and the COFA meet their obligations. Thank you. Joel. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Joel Topham. I work at Sega's Accountants. We are a specialist uh, accountancy firm that works um, with a very wide variety of different law firms across the country. Um, I've been with Sega's for 16 years, working with law firms throughout that entire time. Um, and we cover everything from, you know, making sure that your compliance is always done on time when it should be to uh, providing business advice and um, other um, associated services and cash flow management and anything really that's got a number in it, we will help out with um, whenever you need it. Brilliant. Thank you, uh, all, all, all three of you. Uh, I think it's important to, to, to note that uh, each one of our speakers today is an expert in their in their particular field, uh, and that's a theme that we'll we'll run through this webinar: is to talk to experts to get to get expert advice, as indeed you are as as lawyers in your in your particular field. Uh, so over to to, to me. Uh, last but by no means least, hopefully uh, I'm MD and co-owner of Quill. Uh, we provide cloud-based practice management and legal account software uh, to about 750 law firms of all shapes and sizes, um, small ones, big ones, specialist ones, niche ones, virtual ones, uh, and all sorts. Uh, we also provide outsource cashiering, payroll, typing services uh, that take away the hassle of, of, of back office uh, management of, of the law firm as well. Now, at Quill, over the past 12 months or so, um, we, we get asked these same questions um, through our cashiering service, through our, our software support team, or indeed, you know, my own conversations with with with, with, with people uh, is, you know, where do I start with setting up a new new law firm? You know, what do I have to do in terms of my applications? Who do I talk to for for advice? How do I go about setting up a uh, um, uh, a, a bank account, or, or or when do I do? When do I need to get my business plan together, etc. So we have these who, why, what, when, where, when, how questions all of the time, uh, and we're going to try and, and answer uh, some of those uh, through this through this uh, webinar. So if we go on to the learning outcomes, where we expect and hope you will be uh, by by the time we get to to two o'clock is is an idea of what it takes to start up a new law firm. What mistakes to avoid, because those are the, what, those are the important ones. How to get your professional indemnity cover. How to get your SRA uh, approval. Uh, how you will tackle uh, compliance, risk, and accounting. How to manage your finances so you actually make a make a profit on your on your investment. Who to turn to for advice, and and hopefully some little uh, tips and tricks from our from our experts uh, a, along the way. So the the first the first step. Uh, in this 15-point plan is something that, that 12 months ago I wouldn't have put as, as, as number one. But if we just turn to the first step, I'm going to ask David just to comment on, on this particular step and, and possibly why um, opening a business bank account is, is, is in David's list number one today and maybe why it wasn't uh, 12 months ago. David, over to you. Thank you, Julian. Yes, I have no doubt that uh, step one would be um, opening a business bank account, and I'll explain why. Until we had the COVID-19 crisis, it was relatively straightforward to open a business bank account, whether it was just the business account or whether it was the business account and the client account. However, with the bank's resources arguably being stretched because of all of the various bounce back loan initiatives and other funding arrangements, um, banks have become very resistant uh, to opening new bank accounts and where they have been opening new bank accounts, it's been taking as long as three to four months. Now, 
since we last did a similar webinar, things have changed a little bit over the last few weeks, and that's, I think, principally as a result of the banks being called before a select committee in Parliament uh, to explain themselves. And just before that select committee meeting took place, some of the banks all of a sudden decided to allow the opening of new business bank accounts, which is a massive coincidence, I'm sure. So the situation is a little better than it was in the autumn. I think what I would do if I was starting uh, a new law firm is I think I'd talk to the bank that I currently had a relationship with because, um, of course, they will know you and it would undoubtedly or should be quicker to open any new business account with a bank that you have a relationship with. If for any reason you find that difficult, please do uh, contact us and um, we will try and use our own contacts to see, if, to see if we can get a business bank account opened. But without that, you can't really operate a law firm, obviously, and because it's been taking so long, that is the reason why it has to be step one. Okay, David, that's that's very helpful. So because of this delay, uh, get that bank account application in um, uh, fairly fairly smartish. I'm I'm gonna gonna keep the the, the webinar moving and um, uh, uh, move on to PI cover. And and again, David, you know I've heard all sorts of good stories, bad stories about getting PI cover. How how's the market looking today? It's not looking very good, I'm afraid. Um... I mentioned that we started our business in 2000, so 21 years. I, I think the current market conditions are what they would say are the hardest they've ever been. So when we use the phrase or the word hardest, it means expensive and difficult to get uh, cover. Now, this is for a number of reasons, but the, the two main reasons are that a number of insurers have been exiting the market because of losses. Um, the profits made in the market have been relatively minimal compared to previous years. And also, towards the end of last year, most insurers had met their targets and didn't want to um, provide cover to, to, to new startups. Now, now that we're in the new year, the situation will ease a little bit, particularly from April. But I would imagine over the next few weeks, there are going to be uh, a number of insurers um, open to new business. In fact, yesterday we, we um, started assisting a law firm with writing a cash flow forecast and a business plan and we were in contact with the insurance broker this morning and we're very confident that we are going to be able to obtain insurance but it's not a given. You have to be clear about what it is that you're going to be doing and you have to make it very clear to the insurer that you know what you're talking about. So for example, there was one application that we dealt with a few weeks ago where the client was insistent on offering 10 different areas of law, despite not having much expertise in those 10 areas of law. And we had to work very hard to persuade the client to really only restrict it to one or two areas where he actually had significant expertise. And that's the reason why the insurer wants to see um, key personnel CVs because they want to look at the CV to see is this person really an expert in this field so in order to get insurance they want to see the CV they need to see a cash flow forecast covering a two-year period and they need to see a business plan which um, Joel will talk about shortly. In terms of uh, a tip one common mistake that solicitors make is they approach various brokers let's say four or five different brokers. The idea being, if you, the more people you approach, the more likelihood you have of getting a cheap quote. Doesn't really kind of work that way. Um, it's quite an old fashioned system, um, PI insurance. So it's not, it's not massively computerized like car insurance, for instance. So if you put yourself in the shoes of an underwriter, if broker number one comes forward with a proposal covering your proposed law firm, then the underwriter is going to provide a quote usually. But if he then gets the same proposal from broker two, three, four, and five, that broker, that insurer rather, that underwriter can get fed up and may refuse to quote. I've seen that happen before. The other thing I would say, and I think Julian's going to emphasize this towards the end um, of this webinar, 
is do ask for recommendations because brokers like any other profession are full of good people and not so good people so i'm afraid there are a minority of brokers that will steer solicitors to firms that pay them the most commission i know who those are i also know who the ethical people are so do ask for recommendations to make sure that you don't inadvertently end up getting ripped off and that's Brilliant. the end of thanks david Great. That's that, that's a real. Pra I, I'm, I'm going to keep keep things moving just from a, from a timing point of view. That's really good practical uh, advice. So I, I appreciate that. So sorry to cut you cut you short. So we've got these three. In my mind, we have these three steps. We've got the bank. We've got the PI insurance. But of course, we need a business plan. And 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 Joel, you're a you're a bean bean counter, uh, as I like to call accountants. Um, uh, so so talk to me about what what you would want to see in a in in a business plan. And then I'm going to ask so just to get her her, her her teed up. I'm going to ask Jay about her experience of, of producing her business plan. So Joel, over to you first. Okay. Thank you, Julian. Yeah, as um, as David mentioned, the business plan is one of the the key uh, the key points. It's the next step. Um, because there are lots of key stakeholders in your business that are going to want to see it. So the bank will want to see it, the insurer will want to see it, the SRA will want to see it as well. Um, and from that perspective, it can feel a little bit daunting, but it's also really exciting because this is where you map out what you are going to do with your business and essentially put down into onto paper how you're going to achieve what you want to achieve by starting your own law firm. Um, and you can this is the opportunity to set out how you want to work who you want to work with and what you want to become um key things to focus on financials i'm going to say that as the accountant aren't I? but financials are important you need to know um where you expect to get your money from how much money you're going to need whether you're going to need funding to support you um and you're going to equally need to know where your opportunities are going to be why where you're going to get your work from are you, are you going to be doing direct marketing is it word of mouth all of these sorts of things. Um, and I think it's really important to try and think not just short term, but long term as well. So it's not just about the next 12 months or the next two years, think about the next 10 years as well and try and set that all out as best you can do. And then once you've decided what you want, once you know what you want to do, go and get some help because it's really important that you know that there are people out there who know more about certain bits than you do. And it's important to know what you know, and it's equally important to know what you don't know. Um, the, I think David said it in the context of the services that you're offering, you should focus on what you're good at. Don't offer too, too many things at once. Equally, you should focus on why you went into, why you set up your business, probably not to write detailed financial information. You wanna be a brilliant solicitor. That's why you set up your, that's why you're setting up your own law firm. Um, so, Enjoy it when you're setting it up, but make sure you get the right help to ensure that your financials make sense and that what you're presenting to your stakeholders will be what they want to see. Okay, brilliant. Now, Jay, I, I've I've had a you know you've shared with me your own your own experience, and and uh, I think we'll 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 take a, a journey through your through your experience in terms of how we got today through through this webinar. Just just tell me a bit about your your initial process of setting up your business plan. What practical things did you uh, uh, did you cover uh, and, and experience in that in that journey before you got to the actual setting opening your doors? Yeah, Julian, I mean, I had quite an interesting start because um, I, I, I had set out a business plan based on an agreement with the managing partner of the firm I was leaving um, and everything was all done by agreement or so I thought. Um, I was setting up a business plan to start my own firm with my team, um, all my clients, office space, everything sorted out. Um, Within a few weeks of discussions, that all fell apart and they did a complete about turn and I ended up with none of that. Um, and I'll tell you a bit more about the detail of what happened. But I'd, I, what I'd say is that, you know, you I ended up having to start from scratch with nothing. And so you have to be adaptable and you have to be resilient and be prepared to change your business plan based on what the reality of the situation is, um, which is which is what I had to do. So. <laughs> 
Wow. Okay. Well, I think there's, there's more of this story to uh, to, to follow. But I, I guess uh, a key message there is is uh, uh, make sure you you if you if you are leaving a firm, uh, work out your your relationship with your firm, but also uh, the need for adaptability and 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 flexibility. Okay. If we just move on to the next slide, please. So risk management, compliance. Um, a really, really key part of your um, uh, of your your thinking and your planning. Um, it's a topic in itself, and we could have a we could have not not an hour on on risk management and compliance, but uh, probably a day on risk management and compliance. Um, there's more detail in the uh, in in the ebook. Um, uh, I I think it's a, a topic that really is something that you should talk to experts about. We're not going to go into the detail of, of risk management and compliance today, save to say that, that without that, that plan in place, um, you are going to, you are at big risk of, of, of somebody else closing, closing your office doors uh, very, 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 very quickly. So let, let's move on to um, actually taking, taking the plunge. And, and Jay, um, you know, day one, or, or maybe day minus five, up to day one and day plus five. Tell me about your personal experience. It's a, it's a, it's a scary story, but it's, it's one something that other people are going to uh, potentially experience as well. So they might learn from your, your practical experiences here. Yeah. So on, uh, on day one, I was out in the wilderness um, with no clients, no team, um, a four-year trademark dispute, as it turned out. Uh, over my name and um, not one piece of uh, paper, you know, for, for 20 years I've been practicing and building up a reputation and a client following and precedence, you know, we, we, we sort of survive on precedence and um, things that we've built up. So all my knowledge bank was just what was in my head because the partnership that I left uh, took my leaving so badly that they took everything from me. Um, so I had to, you know, completely start from scratch and I uh, rented a little uh, windowless unit um, off 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 a dual carriageway somewhere, and uh, I sat there on my own. Um, I cried quite a lot, <laughs> thinking, you know, what do I do? What do I do now? Um, and and actually, you know, I, I, they did they did me a favour when I look back. So that was six years ago, and I look back now, and it, it was very very distressing. The whole story was, you know, a, a pitiful story. Really, shouldn't shouldn't have happened. Um, but it made me um, it made me sort of start a business that's that was fit for its time rather than relying on things that you know we'd always done, which is what I would have done had I got access to everything that I'd, I'd sort of previously um, built up. And, and I suppose it made me more determined to prove myself and um, prove to others that I could succeed. Um, and you know it's I think it's been really worth the worth the risk um although there are risks of course and there's hard work uh, involved and anybody starting out a venture on their own knows that you know there are risks involved I had to take quite a lot of personal risk because of this trademark dispute which cost me cost me a lot financially uh, but but I also took quite measured risks I think and thought about you know whether whether I was doing the right thing at all stages um, and uh, and I suppose my conclusion now is that you know I've realised that perhaps I wasn't easy to manage. Uh, the nature of somebody that wants to work for themselves is somebody that's sometimes quite you know a, a bit Jeremy Clarkson. Uh, I think my ex partners <laughs> maybe found me you know good at what I did, but really quite hard to pin down. Uh, and I've learned that actually doing it for myself is much more fulfilling, much more rewarding. And I don't mind telling you I'm in my early fifties, and I just. I, I look back and I really wish that I'd done what I did uh, 10 years ago um, because, you know, you have more energy <laughs> when you're that bit younger and a bit more time to, to build things. So, uh, so yeah, that's where I am now. Wow. Okay. Golly. Well, I, 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 must, admit, I must admit sort of uh, being in a, in a windowless box and uh, having your precedence and everything else taken away from you must have been very, very scary, but you've certainly built a, a very successful business. Um, uh, from that, so it, it just does show what 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 can be done. Okay, so if we just move on to the next slide, and maybe just sort of stepping back slightly, um, time to, to 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 formally apply. So so David, you're you're the man that 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 helps a lot of budding um, uh, law firm owners uh, get their applications in. Um, a few tips from you at that at this point in the process, please. 
Yeah, thank you, Julian. So um, in, terms, in terms of the process, we've already mentioned um, three of the steps. So um, Joel's talked about the business plan. I've talked about PI insurance and opening up a bank account. Now, the, the SRA expect you to complete um, a few forms, depending upon your experience and the categories of law and whether or not you're caught by the anti-money laundering regulations. Um, somebody asked before the webinar, can I be deemed approved? What does deemed approved mean? Well, if you're a solicitor and you haven't had any adverse legal, financial or regulatory history and your predicted annual turnover is going to be under £600,000, then you can possibly escape completing form FA2, which is quite a lengthy, detailed, somewhat onerous form. So that's really what deemed approved is about. But if you want to hear a bit more about that, please uh, do, do, do get in touch. But as, as a minimum, the SRA expect to see evidence of PI insurance, the promise of PI insurance, they expect to see your business plan and the completed forms. And if you just submit those documents, you probably will get a lot of questions. What we tend to do is try and front load the application and anticipate what those questions are going to be. So for instance, um, we would do a business continuity plan to head off questions about what will happen if you can't access your offices, et cetera. We'll do like an exit strategy to head off questions about what would happen if the business fails, what happens to the clients, et cetera. Um, we often do a risk register, which explains um, all the things that could go wrong with a new law firm, together with a plan to minimise, mitigate or avoid the risks altogether. So by doing that, and maybe a couple of other documents, you're really preventing a lot of email table tennis. That's really the point uh, of, of doing that. And typically, um, it takes three months for the SRA to come back. We tend to find it's more like two months. Uh, I think despite the somewhat scary image, we find the authorizations team at the SRA very friendly, very helpful. And I think you've got absolutely nothing to fear with the SRA. It's only really if you don't cooperate with them, um, if you don't respond to them, if you're not transparent, then they, then they become understandably a little bit more difficult to deal with. And one other tip, if you have had adverse legal, financial or regulatory history, don't try and hide it, that they will, they will find it. So a good tip would be before you make the application, um, contact the SRA and explain the background, the situation and find out whether or not that problem would be a barrier to authorization. And you can do it in one or two ways. You could either send an email or you could ask for what's known as a pre-engagement meeting. This is something that the SRA have been offering for six months now. And that gives you an opportunity to have a face-to-face -face video chat about your background, your plans, what it is that you're seeking to achieve. And we occasionally do that where the application is a little bit unconventional or there's some uh, complexity um, to that. Okay, brilliant. Right. Thanks. Uh, thanks, David, for that. That's, that. that's very helpful and some good practical tips uh, in there as well. So one of the things that, that sort of leads on from that is, is the business structure and, and uh, uh, people talk about, you know, am I a sole practitioner? And, and you, may, you may think of yourself as a sole practitioner on day one because that's the way that you're, you are because you are on, on your own. But should you be a limited company or should you be an LLP or goodness knows what? And, and so, so, Joel, you're the accountant here. What, what is the best financial structure to, um, uh, to run with? Is there one solution that fits all? Uh, no, the honest answer is it, it, it depends. And I, it's, a, it's an answer that accountants love is it depends because <laughs> it, it really does. There are, there are four traditional business structures that we, we know of or that, we, that we, we classify things into. There's the sole trader or the consultant. So it's just you on your own no limited liability is the partnership which is you with other people uh, running the law firm there's an llp which is a partnership but with limited liability and then there's the limited company um, and each of them has different tax structures different risk profiles um, and different compliance requirements and so 
And there isn't one single structure that works best for a, a, a law firm. Um, and they, it's simply, that's, that's just as simply put as it is. Um, we've got across our client base, we've got people in all four different categories and all and we've got successful people in all four different categories as well um the most common one today is the limited company most people these days want some form of limited liability but actually the structure that you choose should be based on a number of different factors you need to think about what your own risk risk appetite is so how how much are you willing to risk how much do you want to put on the line for it you want to put think about tax planning there are some tax advantages to some of the structures, but it will depend on what your plans are for your for your your money as to whether they will work or not. You want to think about your exit strategy. How long are you planning to be in in running your own law firm? Um, you want to think about how you want to grow it and how far you want to grow it as well. And then equally, what kind, how much flexibility you're going to need within your structure? Are you planning on taking on additional partners or or getting rid of additional partners, it could be either way. Um, uh, are you planning on growing rapidly or, or just, you know, it's just all about a lifestyle business. It's something that I want to do because I just want to work for myself. Your answers to those questions will determine which is the best structure for you and will weigh up the, weigh up the different pros and cons alongside each one of them. Um, I haven't got time to tell you what all those pros and cons are, but the key point is once you have taken this step, once you know where you're going to go, make sure you get good advice up front on the structure. Um, make sure you get it from somebody who understands the solicitor's rules and the regulatory rules around ownership of a, a law firm as well. Um, and when you focus on your decision, don't just base it on what's right now. Your structure should be determined by your mid to long term goals, not just what's right for you now. Um, and it may even be that your business plan includes a plan to change structure part way through as well. All of that will work. All of that is available to a law firm and it will just depend upon you and whoever is giving you the good advice as to what you choose. Brilliant, Joel, that, that's, that's very helpful. And uh, I think once again, uh, you know, somebody, somebody that understands that, 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 a part, that the partner you live with is, is not necessarily the same as the partner you work with um uh is, is is pretty fundamental so make yeah. sure uh, everybody listening into this webinar that you that you you choose an accountant like joel or, or there are other of course are other other experts across the country but but a, a, an, a, an accountant like joel who understands uh legal uh because mm -hmm. it is different uh, and, and that really, really uh, is is pretty pretty fundamental. Now we, we've talked through this webinar about um, uh, about the areas of law you'll be working in, and uh, uh, whether you're going to be a, a, a attempt to be a jack of all trades or or, or a master of of, a, of your particular designated area, and, and that's very important. Um, uh, David has already said in terms of your SRA application, but pretty much. Every area of law is going to uh, involve you uh, managing uh, your client account and client money, uh, which of course is, is, is a highly regulated part of the uh, legal profession. Uh, it's why we have to focus on money laundering, why we have to focus on KYC uh, and all those other aspects. So, um, Joel, you know, client account and client money, what, what are the options and what should people be doing these days? um so first things first you you absolutely have to make sure that you read the current accounts rules um they were updated 25th of november 2019 um and there was quite a lot of changes brought in from that but make sure that you know what those rules state and then make sure you get training on them as well because the rules themselves do not contain significant detail anymore and yet you are still expected to know that significant detail because it informs on how they will be read by the sra um, and beware that the accounts rules don't just cover client money. They also cover the other aspects of running a matter and running a file. So you cannot ignore them just because you don't intend to hold client money. But once you do decide that, you then need to choose what you, how you look after the client money. Um, step one, make sure you've got some good software in place. It needs to be solicitor specific. It needs to be able to cope with the accounts rules. Um, you will then need to uh, submit an annual report to the SRA. That needs to be done within six months of your year end. That needs to be done by a qualified reporting accountant. 
Um, make sure you engage with somebody who does a lot of these and understands the rules, because not only will they do your report for you, but they will also help you with your compliance with them and they will flag up any issues so that you can rectify them before they become an issue, a, a really big issue. Um, client account and issues with client account is one of the SRA's most common reasons for taking people to the SDT. So make sure that you get it right um, and get it right from the start is my advice because any mistakes to do with client account, there is no such thing as materiality on this. If it's wrong, it's wrong. And it can be really expensive to unwind it and rectify things after the event. Um, getting it right from the start quite often means making sure you've got a good bookkeeper, somebody who understands solicitor's rules, not just accounts. Um, and on the back of that, you know, make sure that that bookkeeper understands the responsibilities that they have to, for you. you know, we talked about focusing on what you're good at. As I said, I don't think any of us will have started a law firm for the benefit of being able to write up our own books and look after our own client money. So if necessary, outsource it. In fact, it might even be more effective to outsource it. Okay, thanks, thanks, Joel. That's that's really, um, really helpful. Now, we talk about, if we move on to the next uh, slide, please. Um, um, you know, we're all getting. I can hear you and feel you getting getting excited about setting up your 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 law firms on the other end of the uh, other end of this 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 webinar. Um, uh, but you know, the old saying, um, uh, 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 turnover is vanity, cash is reality, and there's, a, there's another step in between. Um, Joel, just just talk us through um, cash and cash flow, and I'm going to pick up with David afterwards and. Uh, uh, forewarn you, David, to to, uh, to be thinking about how much money uh, do you need to actually get yourself off the ground. But Joel first. Okay, so yeah, there's all sorts of phrases around cash that are very catchy and easy to remember. I, I like cash is king. Cash is king's my one, Julian, that I use. It is absolutely right. critical to the success of your business to get your cash flow right, okay? There are lots of profitable law firms that have failed because their cash flow is not what they expected it to be or because they've just misunderstood it. Um, a cash flow will be one of the key parts that will be scrutinized in your business plan. So you must have that in there and make sure that it makes sense. And the, the hard thing about a cash flow is, is the cash flow is actually the end point of a working capital cycle. So your cash, to get cash, you have to go through a journey, as you will well know, that you've got to meet the client, you've got to receive their instructions, you've then got to deliver what you said you can do, then you've got to bill them, and then finally, hopefully, you'll get paid. And knowing how long that cycle will take will determine how much money you need. And that cycle will vary to depend on what type of work you're doing. So conveyancing has a much shorter working capital cycle than clinical negligence does. So that will depend on then how much funding you're going to need because every step of that cycle costs, whether it's cost time cost or an actual physical cost, it all costs. And so knowing where our cash flow is going to be will probably determine whether we're still standing in 18 months time. Okay, brilliant. How much do you need, David? Well, I'll give some examples, but I think Joel um, kind of covered it in a, by explaining all the different circumstances involved and, you know, the different types of law, for instance. But let me let me try and get, give a straight answer. So you're going to need a thousand pounds as the application fee to the SRA. If you're operating a client account, there's a compensation fund fee, which is again just under another thousand pounds. So you're up to two thousand there. Mm. If you're going to have a website, you can either do it yourself if you've got really great technical skills, but most will instruct a website firm. And I think for a decent firm, you'd need at least two thousand, if not three thousand. More like three if you're going to have lots and lots of content, and you'd have lots of content if you wanted to get up the Google rankings, for instance. Um, if you were going to instruct uh, a specialist to assist you, 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 that might cost you a few hundred, it might cost you more than a few hundred pounds, etc. When, when new clients put me on the spot and say, how much do I actually need? Well, I give two answers. I say, I think you're probably going to need about 10,000 pounds. Now that is assuming that the type of law that the practitioner 
is practicing is low risk. So for instance, if you are practicing crime or immigration, they are deemed low risk, and the typical premium would be round about three to four thousand pounds. If on the other hand, you're doing conveyancing, it's going to be significantly more than that because over 50% of all PI claims are conveyancing. And it is significantly harder to get cover for conveyancing because as I explained earlier, it's quite a hard market. So Gillian, it really depends on the areas of law that you're seeking to practice and how many, if any, staff you're going to employ at the outset. But 10K is a decent yardstick if you're practicing in a low area, a low risk area, I should say. And then okay, David, I, just to chip back in, I, I think it will also then depend also on how many clients you've got. I'm sure Jay will mm. tell us that she didn't, she you know, having planned to take clients with her, she was planning on using a lot less to start up than what she probably eventually did using to start up. So. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, right. Well, well, Jay, we'll, we'll we'll pick up on your marketing and your and your marketing bit in a, in, a, in a minute or two. Um, but I, I'm I'm keen to keen to crack on. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there's all sorts of deadlines from a, a, a routine accounting and uh, tax and filing that you need to do. Uh, you know, some people have got um, to submit self-assessment tax returns by the 31st of this month, and I know that. Uh, mm -hmm. Most accountancy firms get very busy as the uh, end of January looms, so you've got your quarterly VAT to worry about, uh, and so on. We, we've detailed some of this in the in the book, um, so by all means look at that. Um, but if you need uh, more more advice, more guidance on that, then again um, talk to your accountant or find yourself an accountant to talk to uh, to get your your guidance around those those basic accounting and regulatory responsibilities. I'm not going to not going to dwell on that one uh, anymore. Um, today and let, let's move on to talk about um, uh, your practice, whether it's uh, uh, bricks and mortar or or, or virtual. Um, David, this is something that you're you're quite passionate about, and I'll, I'll start with you, and then and then Jay, I'm going to get you to uh, uh, put a spanner in the works of your with your own experience. Yeah, David. Well, I, think, I, I I think that um, the potential lawyer law firm, I should say, will have a preference from the outset whether or not they want to um, practice from home and therefore have a virtual presence or whether they would prefer to have an office. Some of this is really down to personal preference. Some of this is down to the area of law you practice. So for instance, if you were practicing mental health law, um, it, it may be suitable to, to practice from home because um, mental health clients are, are generally seen in hospitals, uh, for instance, they're not seen at, a, at, a, at an office, for instance. Likewise, it may be possible uh, with crime because the clients you tend to see at the police stations and in the courts, etc. But for other areas of law, um, it's often advantageous to have an office. Now, just as a tip, if you are going to go for an office, then please make sure you don't get yourself tied into a very long-term lease. I have a client that is tied into a 25-year lease signed before the, the virus happened and uh, obviously that's a, a regret uh, for that particular firm and we have had a number of clients that have downsized over the last year because we've all learned to use Zoom, Teams, etc. Um, um, and, and we've got used to uh, remote working so um, it is easier than it's ever been to, to, to work from home. I think just finally, before I hand over, uh, we, we had a question that I've been asked to, to mention, well, what about the so-called freelancer model? Is that viable and can I get insurance was the question. And the, the question, the answer is yes, the, the SRA do now under the new regulations accept this new model called a freelancer. And that means that whilst the individual is regulated by the SRA, the entity is not. And if you are not doing reserved legal activities, somewhat controversially, you don't have to get PI insurance, which I think is risky and I would never recommend that. If you are doing reserved legal activities, you do have to get PI insurance, but there isn't a minimum level. Um, in terms of the application process, it's actually a notification process. It's very, very straightforward. It's a case of notifying the, the SRA through the My SRA portal. Um, we have had an insurance quote for freelancer. Not every insurer is offering insurance to freelancers, but some are. So the answer is absolutely, you can get insurance. 
Okay, thanks, David. Thank you for picking up on that question we had from somebody in the in, in the background. So, Jay, you, you're probably bucking the trend a bit in terms of your view on um, uh, bricks and mortar versus virtual. Just, just how how are you operating? Um, well, I mean, I've always had um, remote working available to people that, that that you know need it and want it, and I'm a big fan of it. But I decided to have an office from the outset because I think there are some real advantages. And even with COVID, I'm keeping an office open. Um, you know, it gives you credibility straight away having an office in the client's eye for most areas of work. Um, it distances your work and home life, um, especially if you've got children, as, as I, you know, as I have. Uh, it looks professional. And I think one of the big things for me during the COVID period and a lot of the clients that we're advising is that um, although my team are all working one day a week in the office only at the moment, um, it's, it's their opportunity to do things like collaboration, have supervision, um, filing and organising things that they just can't do at home. And the really big one is well-being. You know, you don't know what's going on if they're at home. And I think at least if you have some touch points where it's, you know, for us only one day a week, I can, I can eyeball them, I can make sure they're all right because you know, some of them are some of them have struggled, particularly younger members of staff, I find, have found, um, you know, remote working really quite difficult because it doesn't give you the same sort of structure and force you to interact with people. So I think that's quite important. So I'm a fan of having an office space. But it doesn't have to be expensive. You know, serviced offices are readily available. You don't, you know, you don't need a big space unless you've got lots and lots of staff. Yeah. Okay, brilliant, brilliant. So, so I think flexibility is is the name of the game when it comes to comes to office space these days. Um, yeah, you know, physical presence is important, but uh, uh, we can all work from home. And uh, having an infrastructure around that that flexibility is really really important as well with with cloud based um, uh, software and so on. So that it doesn't matter whether you're at the office or um, uh, are at home, or maybe Jay, as you were in the snow this morning, I believe uh, wherever you are, you can um, uh, you can. Log on and, uh, and 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 get and get some work done. Okay, folks, let's let's move on. Um, and and technology and 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 Jay, maybe I, I I'll, I'll stick with you if you don't mind, and and just ask you about you know what was your process of finding the right technology to to get your law firm up and up and running. So um, you know, I have to confess, I think this touches on this step and perhaps the next one. But you know, when I set up, I didn't have a clue about about um, platforms or compliance or financial management or any of these things um, and I had partners who who looked after all the boring bits you know as I as I called them of running a firm um, but I realized quite quickly that I needed to outsource those bits that I didn't understand so that I could concentrate on the things that you know I was good at and and, and where my energy should lie so um, I uh, you know I got help with submitting my SRA authorization and from day one, I got you guys involved at Quill, um, which which has been which has been brilliant for me because um, Quill deal with my payroll, my legal cashiering, um, my uh, document management, and uh, all the compliance things. So the client account, the bank reconciliations, all these things that you know I, I really wouldn't know um, how how to deal with that. And then of course, as time's gone on, I have um, explored the option of bringing that in-house um, but you know the, the technological platforms that you have and because you're working with so many firms you know you see lots of different um, firms and how they operate and, and I couldn't replicate that by having somebody in-house so I think the peace of mind that you get if you get good technology that works and, and this being cloud-based so as you say I got stuck in the snow today um, but I can you know I can access from my phone or my laptop wherever I am I can access my you know, staff time recording, my outgoings, my cash flow, um, what fees are coming in, and that to me is really, really valuable. Okay, that, 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 that's that's helpful to to understand. I think I think you know the cloud. Without the cloud, this whole this whole planet would have been in a in a very different different place uh, in 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 the last twelve months. Um, and I think when we when we also when we sort of moving on a slide, talk about um, uh, outsourcing. You know, you you both. Um, Provide outsourcing uh, services, Jay, in terms of your uh, HR model, uh, and you you consume 
um, outsourcing in in the way that you, you that you use quill services. You know, what what what's your view on on outsourcing as both a, a provider and a uh, and a, and a consumer of those? Then, is there anything else you got to add? No, no, I haven't got anything else to add on outsourcing the bits that I can't do. I, I just think it's a no-brainer. Why would you why would you waste your management time um, when you could be charging you know a good rate in in delivering your services on doing things that um, aren't within your own specialism? Um, as for um, outsourcing, do you want me to talk a bit about you know the? the well, outsourcing? I think yeah, I think move move on to to um, people because I think um, you know you you've got uh, we, well, well any any firm hopefully as it grows is going to be talking about it's going to be employing people and and you've got some really strong views around people and people management. So just just talk about that for a bit, Jay, please. Yeah, so obviously as an employment lawyer, I'm I'm you know aware of the importance of having the right people in the right job, and I've seen it for so many years. I've advised law firms and individual lawyers um, when when things have gone wrong, which is which is pretty expensive for them. Then, uh, so so my advice is always to put some time and energy, and if necessary, some cost into getting the recruitment process um, right. You know, getting the right contracts and policies in place. Um, keeping on top of staff performance and um, and absence, and I think outsourcing is a really good way of doing that. Um, giving myself a plug, we do that very well. <laughs> but you know, there are lots of other providers um, that provide HR services. But again, as with your accountants or compliance people, you know, if you if you outsource to somebody that understands how a law firm works, you're at a at a real advantage. Um, and uh, and you know it's far less costly than having somebody in an in an in-house HR role, I think, and you've got more expertise um, than you would have uh, with one HR manager, say, within your organisation. Um, and staff issues can become really tricky, really sensitive, um, and they can take an awful lot of um, time. So you know it's a really good idea, I think, to outsource. And then per some of the pro problems that I've seen, particularly in law firms, are where um, employees haven't been given the right contract from from the outset and you know great lawyers are great to have within your team but they're not the kind of people you want to end up in a dispute with um, because you can get into a real pickle with them uh, and lawyers can be very very you know um, dogged about uh, winning a point if I'm honest and so you know it can it can become very protracted so you want to set things up in the right way to try and avoid those things and building in things like restrictive covenants to protect um, your position. Um, some outsourced services like ours um, are also insurance backed. So, you know, the peace of mind that you get knowing that if you were taken to a tribunal, um, your, rep your legal representation is covered, your damages are, are covered, is well worth having. And I suppose I'll just finish on, because I am really passionate about getting your people right, which I think is critical in the law firm. You know, if you create a positive culture and you've got the right practices and the right policies in place from the outset, then that's going to see you through as the business grows. Whereas if you are sort of winging it to start with, you know, as soon as you start adding people on, it becomes much harder to get those um, practices right. Uh, so, you know, I'd say always do it from the outset. Strong foundations, eh? Don't build don't build your business on sand. Build it on a on a on a strong set of foundations and principles, which I think is a a key theme of your message there. And I think one of the things that I keep coming back to in this in this webinar is is the fact that you know this this panel of four people is uh, are all experts in their in their own specific area. And and David, I'd like to pick up with you in terms of um, uh, turning to professionals um, uh, professional advice when you, when when you need it. Um, you know, you're you're somebody that that is interacting with lots of other people uh, for 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 support and advice. And what are, what are your views on, on on this topic, please? Well, I think I think you should, like I said earlier about a, a slightly different topic. I think you should ask around um, and and through word of mouth get recommendations in relation to whichever experts you're going to use, whether it's um, software houses like like, like Quill, um, accountants outsourcing specialists, law firms. I mean, t taking uh, Jay's firm as an example, she just focuses on the one area of law. Therefore, she's far more likely to be an expert in employment than uh, a, a solicitor that's practicing in 10 areas of law, including employment. And I think you should also not get taken in by uh, people that have 
outstanding sales skills. So if you go to a conference, you'll see a lot of exhibitors and might think, gosh, they are absolutely brilliant. Well, they may be brilliant until they've got your money. And then you might find that they're not so good as they, as they seem. So don't get taken in by, by sales patter. Talk to clients of that uh, particular expert. And that way, you're far less likely uh, to get ripped off. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, David. So I feel we've gone on a bit of a journey here. We've, you know, we've got our bank account sorted out. We've got our SRA application in place. We've got our PI cover in place. Uh, we found an office, so we've got the um, uh, a spare room in the house lined up as our, as our office, uh, and we're ready to go. Um, but of course, you need to get your name out there. There's no good going through this process and no, no clients coming uh, through the metaphoric door um, or, or, or knowing about you. Now, Jay, you've done this and, and you've got a lovely website. So, so what are your sort of tips and uh, hints for, for people looking to get, um, get the name out there? Um, yeah, I've never spent a lot of money on marketing. Um, I, I, you know, I've done, I've done things fairly frugally on that front, but it's the bit I enjoy. So I suppose I put more energy into it than some lawyers who have, you know, different different um, skills and interests. Um, but for me, for me, this is one of the best bits about running your own firm. So for me, creating a strong brand and communicating that to my target audience was was key, and and it still is. I still spend a lot of um, personal time on that. Uh, I set up six years ago and it was quite a unique concept to put the, you know, the employment law and the HR together um, at the time. Um, and my aim was to provide a cost effective, very expert um, retainer based service to, you know, to, to help businesses, uh, particularly SME businesses. And, and I think we do that really well. But if you create something really good, what you find is that other people follow and i've seen in six years the number of other firms that are adding you know that that um that hr dimension so you've always got to be uh, innovating and keeping on top of the competition and being you know present in in people's minds um so i think again you can outsource pr and marketing but i think the best way to do that you know is really to write blogs to make sure that you're um recognized as an expert by talking um, wherever you're you know, allowed to talk about your your sort of specialist subject. Right. Okay, brilliant. And I think I think one of the, the key points that I always take away from uh, uh, from from your words there, Jay, are energy versus spend. You can you you know I'd rather spend the energy spend the time in energy rather than in pound notes and i think that's what you've done and 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 clearly you know through the through channels like social media and blogging and everything else uh, that is not an expensive way of getting a a, a strong brand out there and and uh, you, you've clearly done that uh, very very well so folks we're, we're we're coming up to to two o'clock i think we're gonna we're gonna struggle to find time for the questions so i just like to try and summarize where where we've got to in this journey of setting up a, 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 a new law firm. So don't delay getting in that um, application in for, for a new bank account. Um, be mindful of some of the challenges uh, around getting your PI insurance in place. Get that business plan in place and, 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 and in parallel with those, those, those first two steps. Keep a very close eye on, on risk management. Don't forget that uh, you know it's the uh, regulators that can shut you down very very quickly if you don't have your risk management in place and, and fall foul of uh, some some inappropriate um, uh, client or process. Uh, prepare yourself mentally. You know you, you're moving potentially from a from a big team to to being on your own. That is a that is a change in in, in mental outlook. Uh, I know we've all had lots of experience of that over the last year, but that is something to be concerned about. Uh, get that. Um, authorization application form in. Uh, speak to Joel about your terms of ownership. Are you going to be this LLP or LTD or partnership or whatever the other one was, sole practitioner? Um, uh, don't forget client money. Uh, that's what will, will catch you out if you don't get uh, that client money um, managed properly um, and, and uh, uh, the, the, the rec documented properly. Um, cash, cash is king, as, uh, as Joel has said. Um, uh, I tried to get David to give me a, give me a number around the amount of money I need if I was going to set up a law firm. K is a number I've heard. It does depend. Uh, I do I do get that, uh, but there there was a number that we forced out of an advisor, which is uh, uh, quite an unusual thing to to to, to choose to, to achieve. Um, uh, real real office or virtual law firm? Um, I I think it's a bit of both. 
uh, these days. Um, I think I know um, two or three very successful virtual law firms. They still have an office. Uh, so I think um, Jay's mix of, of having a base, a physical place to, to deal with the mental health issues, uh, but at the same time, uh, the flexibility to, to work from home and to, and to stay safe, as they say, uh, is, is important. Um, get the right technology in place, folks. Uh, you need some technology, particularly in this, in this current climate, which will work for you wherever you are, um, you know, at the office, stuck in the car, um, at, at home, uh, because again, your lifestyles are such that the, the, the boundary between work life and home life can get more blurred, uh, and therefore getting the right technology in place is, is important. And, and outsource what you don't know, uh, whether it's your HR um, uh, requirements from an HR specialist, whether it's your cashiering requirements, whether it's your payroll requirements, whether it's your, your um, accountancy services, whatever they are, outsource what you don't know and focus on what you're good at. Um, you're not a jack of all trades. You can't become bookkeepers uh, and legal experts uh, all, in the, all in the same, same time. It just doesn't work. Look out for professionals like like David, like Joel, um, like Jay, if you're looking for, for, for HR support. Um, and, and finally, uh, you know, get your name out there from a marketing sense. And if you get your name out there, and it's not expensive, as Jay has, has, has demonstrated, um, get your name out there, you will, we will get people coming back to you. Um, and, and you can do that very, very cost, cost effectively. So uh, finally, then, if we, if we just move on to the next slide, um, you will, as I said at the beginning, um, all of the delegates that are still with us uh, get um, the ebook this afternoon. Um, if you do think that Quill is the, the right ingredient for you in terms of um, uh, your software and, and backup service, then we are giving anybody that attended this, this, this webinar a thousand pound credit, redeemable against software training, setup fees, and or, and or data conversion. Uh, so uh, you'll get detail of that in your follow up. Uh, email email today. Now I do know if we just move on to the next slide. Uh, I do know that my um, colleagues uh, on this webinar are very very happy to uh, chat with you on email or on maybe progress that to a, to a phone call if you so wish. Uh, again, in the ebook you will see their email addresses. They are also on the screen in front of you if you want to take a take a note of them. Uh, so if you if you've got a concern about your 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 application, I'm sure David will 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 support you. Likewise, if you need an accountant, I'm sure Joe will be happy to to support you as well. And they'll do all of that on a uh, on a confidential basis. So thank you everybody. If we just move on to the final slide, thank you everybody for uh, coming along. Thank you very much to to our panel of speakers. I'm sorry we don't have time for 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 any any further questions. Uh, at the moment, uh, and I just say to you all, good luck in 2021 with your new venture. Uh, it'll be very, very exciting for you in very, very interesting times. Thanks, guys, for attending. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye. Bye.